Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Calatrello. I guess things have changed a little bit since the last time that we were together. So this morning, I put together some slides on American Romanticism, which is uh, our next literary period uh, that we're going to um, go through in English 251. In this presentation, we'll look at the dates, five reasons for its development, and its defining characteristics. Some mark the movement beginning about 1820 with the publication of William Cullen Bryant's poem Thanatopsis, which we'll read together, or perhaps Washington Irving's sketchbook, 1819 and 1820, or Fenimore Cooper's, James Fenimore Cooper's The Pioneers in 1823. But we know that the Romantic vision operates uh, and is evident far earlier in the works, for instance, of Philip Freneau. If you recall the poem that we read in class, The Wild Honeysuckle, we were able to identify that this poem seemed a little different than some of his other poems, which uh, seemed to be more of poems from uh, the Age of Reason or the Enlightenment. If you remember, Freneau seems to have uh, one foot in the 18th century and one foot in the 19th century. So the beginning year of most literary movements is difficult to establish. Some will even go uh, as early as 1800 or as late as 1830 for Romanticism. I like 1817 with William Cullen Bryant's poem, Thanatopsis. We're more certain, though, of the closing date, either the beginning or the end of the Civil War, as the conclusion of the peak period of Romanticism. If we're really looking at it as, as a distinct period, I sort of like the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, for that closing date. Now, that said, strains of American Romanticism were found later in the early realists that come after the Civil War and continue right into our own time, especially in popular uh, culture art forms. And so Romanticism is by no means dead at all. We still see traces of it. And as we go through these slides, and then you begin to think about movies, um, uh, maybe other books and television shows you may uh, see for yourself romanticism uh, at work. One reason for its development is the gradual erosion of Puritanism and other New England Calvinist sects, and the emergence of the Unitarian Church, which can perhaps be viewed as a compromise of Calvinism and deism. I know that you all remember the conversations that we had with respect to deism and the texts of Franklin, Jefferson, and Thomas Paine. Unitarianism is a Christian denomination. It states that God exists in one being. It rejects the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, uh, you know, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the reasons for the literary period known as American Romanticism developing. I think chief among the reasons uh, was the erosion of Puritanism or the New England Calvinist uh, sects uh, and the emergence of the Unitarian Church, uh, which can perhaps be viewed as a compromise of Calvinism and deism. You remember we spoke and read quite extensively extensively about deism. The Unitarian Church, which sort of comes into uh, fashion in America in the 18th, late 18th and early 19th century, is a Christian denomination. It states that God exists in one being, but rejects that doctrine of the Holy Trinity. So you can sort of see the uh, 
the seed ideas of deism manifesting in Unitarianism. A second reason for its development was that Puritans did not encourage literary forms like the novel, drama, or a secular poetry. Literary imagination then was discouraged by religious orthodoxy and dogma. A third reason is that when Puritanism declined as a cultural power, even though we may say we can still feel some of its uh, uh, force, it no longer held such a tight rein on the imagination of New England. And New England really does come to dominate American literature throughout the 19th century. A fourth reason for its development was the influence of other Romantic writers, English Romantic writers, the French and the German Romantics, all of whom seemed to be responding to the Enlightenment rationalism and the neoclassicism of the previous age. You have to remember that Americans' writers were also very avid readers, and so Romanticism as a movement takes hold first in Europe and then to England and then jumps the Atlantic. Uh, and then we begin to uh, express ourselves uh, similarly. Uh, number five, the rise of a political nationalism fueled by the desire for a cultural nationalism. Or if we put it another way, if we think about the political maturity that we felt after the Declaration of Independence and the formation of a new union, there were many who felt and believed strongly that this greatness, this new nation, demanded a corresponding new and imaginative and mature uh, uh, art form. So we had declared ourselves politically independent from our English ancestors, yet we were still culturally quite dependent on them with respect to literary traditions and conventions. The first characteristic of American Romanticism is that a sense of wonder infuses Romantic works. The Romantic aesthetic, its vision, sees often the extraordinary in the most ordinary of things. Everything is meaningful, is alive, and interconnected for the Romantic. So the universe itself, the world through which we move, reveals itself to human beings. And we can see something ordinary as a drop of water to Ralph Waldo Emerson or a blade of grass to Walt Whitman. This attitude inspires and undergirds many romantic works with an emotional vitality that has yet to be quite expressed in the way that the romantics do. A second characteristic of Romanticism, the Romantics favor the emotions, the intuition, and the imagination over the intellectual, the scientific, the rational. They can be downright, explicitly anti-intellectual. We consider Ralph Waldo Emerson's statement in The American Scholar. He writes there that books are for the scholar's idle times. When he can read God directly in nature. The hour is too precious to be wasted in other men's transcripts of their readings. And so you can see this is very much an anti-intellectual anti -intellectual statement, isn't it? Why spend time book learning when you can actually be out engaged and moving through the world, living life, experiencing it, and knowing it uh, firsthand and immediately? The 
similarly, uh, another characteristic of romanticism is that romantics believe in the potentiality of all things and of all people. They believed that man was inherently good, innately good, and if left alone, could achieve great things and reach their full potential. They are thus often anti-authoritarian and anti-institution. Sometimes in American Romanticism, we can meet characters who are seem uneducated, untutored, uh, or somehow living beyond the reach of civilization, like children uh, or the Native Americans. These two groups are often idealized in Romantic works, as they have yet to feel fully the corrupting mechanism of civilization. Thus, the Romantics had a great faith in the directing resource of a subconscious inner life. So the intuition, the imagination, the inner experience of the individual is always privileged over the objective or the external sources of traditional knowledge and wisdom. Now that said, uh, or I should say that also, uh, Romanticism is for the most part an optimistic aesthetic. They see an inherent goodness in, in, as I said, just about everything. Now, that said, there is a strain of romanticism called dark romanticism. And we can see that uh, most evidently through writers such as Poe, Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Herman Melville. If you have read or studied them before, you know that the lens through which they view human experience is uh, somewhat dark. The Romantics had a healthy contempt for the past. They were looking for new approaches to life, and they refused to be restricted and held to traditions and the wisdom of the past. As Ralph Waldo Emerson reminds his audience in The American Scholar, each age must write its own books. The books of an older will not fit this. Meek young men grow up in libraries with their nose stuck in it, right? In the books, believing it their duty to believe the views of people like Cicero and Locke and Francis Bacon, forgetting that Locke and Bacon were themselves once only young men in libraries when they wrote. In many romantic texts, and I'm thinking of Emerson and Thoreau here, you always see an emphasis and, and, and an insistence on the present tense and the individual interacting again and deriving meaning and understanding of his or her condition, right, by immediate individual experience. Certainly another defining uh, and exciting characteristic of American Romanticism is that the American Romantics were men and women who were uh, people of action. And they admired reformers uh, and, again, of individual action. So John Brown, when he leads his uh, slavery insurrection, uh, was a hero, an enormous hero to people like Thoreau, Emerson, and Melville. So the Romantics, and particularly the Transcendentalists, who we'll talk about later, uh, were men and women of action. They wanted to live uh, and not to write. Uh, they wanted to live and understand their lives to the full extent that they could, not be obsessed with the past. Thoreau emphasized the importance of doing here he writes, my life has been the poem that I would have writ, but I could not live, I'm sorry, I could not both live and utter it. So the impulse for reform and action, the belief in the individual, inspired romantics to become quite involved in the two principal social issues of their day, the abolitionist movement and the earliest expressions that what will become of what will become the women's rights movement.
we already know this one from our early reading of Freneau's poem, The Wild Honeysuckle, that the Romantic expresses a deep and very abiding love of the natural world, which they perceive as a source of wisdom, a source of guidance, a source of consolation and happiness. We will see this most evidently, perhaps, in Brian's poem, Thanatopsis. I encourage you to look in the center of your book where you'll see some colored prints, some of which are from a group of painters known as the Hudson River School, called the Hudson River because they lived and painted the landscape of the Hudson River in the great state of New York. Uh, so I would encourage you to look through that and you could see how the landscape paintings often reflect this uh, uh, this profound sense of uh, awe of the natural world that the Romantics had. Another characteristic of American Romanticism is that it can be uh, adventuresome, uh, boyish, in fact. Leslie Fiedler points out in his landmark study, Love and Death in the American Novel, that American fiction of this period often will feature exciting and really exotic stories uh, of, of great adventure, of life at sea, or of life on the frontiers, or life in the woods, stories of life among cannibals, or gothic horror tales, if we think about Edgar Allan Poe and his castles and the macabre settings that he uh, uses for so many of his stories, of Indian fights and struggles out west, as may be best seen in the fiction of James Fenimore Cooper with his leather stocking stories, uh, novels like The Last of the Mohicans, for example. American Romanticism is a symbolic uh, literature. Uh, if we think about the works of Poe, Hawthorne, and Melville, we'll see that these writers really uh, used symbolism effectively to help them communicate their themes. If we think about Poe, if you've ever read his story, The Fall of the House of Usher, it, it is a literal house. It's a liter literal manor home. Uh, which ultimately at the end of the story collapses and falls inward upon itself and is swallowed up into this abyss. And so while it functions certainly in the literal sense, the story, the symbol suggests what's happening to the family, to the Usher family, because it too is falling apart psychologically and, uh, and physically too. Hawthorne's great novel, The Scarlet Letter, I mean, you can't think of maybe a, uh, a better example of a symbolic novel. Herman Melville's uh, uh, Moby Dick, uh, likewise, uh, employs uh, symbolism. When we consider the Romantic writers, particularly right next to the writers of the Enlightenment, and yes, I see the typographical error now in the Enlightenment, uh, the Age of Reason and so forth, we see that Romantic authors are far, far more subjective, uh, openly drawing upon their own personal experiences, their own autobiographical selves, far more subjective in that expression of their imagination, of their sense of, uh, of their experiences, uh, in a way that we don't really see writers of, you know, we don't see Thomas Jefferson really doing that, or, or a Benjamin Franklin. We don't see a lot of uh, a subjective reflection on their emotions, their imaginations, their intuition. But we get that with the Romantic period. We see people probably in many ways more like uh, our own modern selves.
Finally, American romantics were intensely uh, intensely nationalistic. Uh, They called for a development of and support for a native literature, a new and unique independent country like the United States of America, they believed should have a corresponding new, unique and independent literature. So even though we had declared ourselves politically independent from uh, Great Britain, uh, we were still very, very culturally dependent on them with respect to how we, uh, in many ways, how we dressed and how we lived, our architecture, uh, and certainly uh, our literature. Uh, But it's during this time, the American Romantic period, where American writers, now that we are a generation, at least, uh, or two, uh, out from the American Revolution, They begin looking to one another and they begin identifying uh, the need to create what will become a literature that is unique to America. At the very heart of American Romanticism is Transcendentalism, which we will discuss when we arrive at Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, uh, and the life and writing of Margaret Fuller. Transcendentalism is a subset of American Romanticism. So all Transcendentalists are Romantic but not all romantics are transcendentalists. I want you to see that distinction. 